the icy peaks of the high Andes. This is the land of the Incas, of lost cities and legends of gold. But the Incas prize something more precious to them than gold, the South American camels, their living treasures. This dainty-looking creature is called the vicuña. Its golden fleece is the finest in the world. To wear it was once a privilege of the select few. The Vicuñas have made their home high in the Andes. This 5,000 mile mountain chain runs down the entire west coast of South America. Over half of it is in Chile. Situated in the far north corner of Chile is Lauca National Park, one of the finest sanctuaries for Vicuña. The landscape hasn't changed much since the first camel ancestors migrated from the Great Plains of North America. Some of those early camels migrated to Asia and the Middle East to become the well-known humped camels. Others migrated south to the Andes, eventually becoming the four South American camels, the ones without humps. At these high elevations, conditions are extreme. It's a land of difficult terrain, scorching heat, and bitter cold. Llamas and alpacas have been domesticated by humans for more than 4,000 years. These animals are vital to the native people, such as these Aymara Indians, who have been dependent on them for centuries. People and animals are outfitted with the most perfect insulation to combat the cold. Wool, thick, luxurious, multi-purpose wool. The frost on the backs of these domesticated llamas and alpacas shows the effectiveness of their insulation. Virtually no body heat escapes through these coats. But the fleece of their wild cousin, the vicuña, has fibers which are seven times finer than human hair. In fact, the vicuña wears the finest animal wool in the world. The vicuña is easily identified by its long silky white bib. The other wild camel of the Andes is the guanaco. Larger than the delicate vicuña, it's wrapped in a coat that is almost as fine. One activity all these camels enjoy is dust bathing, something they do several times a day. This fluffs out their coats to maintain their superior insulation. All of them have adapted special features perfectly suited to high mountain living. 
A split upper lip allows them to graze close to the ground without damaging the roots of the fragile plants, upon which they depend. They also have three pairs of sharp canine teeth, which males use for biting when they fight. Their hearts and lungs are enlarged, allowing them to live comfortably at elevations that would leave most animals gasping. All of them are ruminants and chew the cud to gain maximum nourishment from the coarse, sparse grass. Their feet are also special. They have softly padded soles, which keep the horny part of the hoof off the ground. This means they don't damage the delicate vegetation found in the harsher regions of their range. The pads are flexible, allowing them to be sure-footed and agile on the rocky slopes. They live on the Altiplano, or High Plain, sharing it with other specialized animals like the rare giant Andean coot, nearly as big as a turkey. Nearby salt lakes are breeding and feeding grounds for three different kinds of flamingos, including these Andean flamingos. The Altiplano is a bleak land that supports low shrubs and tufts of coarse grass. It provides some nourishment for the scattered groups of Vicuña. Their favorite grazing is the rich mixture of grasses, herbs, and sedges found in the boggy regions, watered by streams flowing from surrounding peaks. Unlike the humped desert camels, Vicuña must have water every day, whether from streams or moisture from grass. Smallest and daintiest of the South American camels, an adult Vicuña stands only three feet high at the shoulder. The males and females look almost identical. Vicuña families consist of a mature male with a harem of up to ten females and their offspring. All year round, they live on a permanent territory of between 20 and 100 acres. From a very early age, vicuñas learn to deposit their dung in special areas throughout their territory. Many are placed near the boundaries and become important markers. However, their function is not to keep other vicuña out, but to keep the family group safely in. The dominant male, the leader, emphasizes his authority by using the dung piles while he guards the edge of his territory. 
Sometimes their boundaries follow natural features, such as a stream. Where these don't exist, dung piles are the only markers. Most of the leader's waking hours are spent patrolling his boundaries for potential invaders. From a strategic vantage point, he can spot an intruder and immediately give chase. There's a lot of posturing and threatening gestures, including flattened ears and raised tail. But if they really want to make a point, they spit. As a parting gesture, they spit again. Once honor has been satisfied, the males rejoin their respective families. A young male establishes his first territory when he's around four years old, but it's usually on poor grazing grounds. Over the next few years, he will gradually acquire mates and begin to build a family. Yearling vicuñas are evicted from their families before the next generation arrives. This male has had enough of his nine-month-old son, who should be ready to fend for himself. It's time for him to leave home. By limiting the size of the group in this way, the male ensures that the territory is not overgrazed and that there's no inbreeding. After three days of being kept apart from his family, the young male finally gets the message. While father goes off to rejoin his wives, the young male is left alone for the first time in his life. The yearling is destined to join a herd of young bachelors, many newly estranged from their families like himself. He'll stay with them for at least three years before trying to establish his own territory. The bachelors have no fixed abode and feed on the barren hillside where the vegetation is poor. But at the first opportunity, they trespass into the lush areas belonging to established families, hoping to get a decent meal before they're driven off. For evicted juvenile females, their transition into adulthood is a bit easier. They're accepted into other families or taken in by territorial males without mates. Domesticated llamas and alpacas have an entirely different experience when they become yearlings. Their coming of age is celebrated by an ancient ceremony called the floreo. In early summer, the Aymara Indians, the native people of these high plains, gather together their llamas and alpacas for this annual ritual. Young animals are adorned with tufts of dyed llama wool as protection against evil spirits.
Colorful ear tufts also help to identify each one of them. The origins of this ceremony are lost in time, but the ancient Incas believe these creatures were a gift to them from the sun. They celebrated these animals because their life could not exist without them. They offered blessings, hoping the mountain god would increase the size of their herds in the coming year. A brief prayer and a toast complete the ceremony. Summer on the Altiplano is also the time when the young are born. This vicuña is giving birth. She's watched over by her mate. Vicuña have only one offspring at a time. They're called cria and are usually born in the morning. This gives them time to dry out so they don't freeze to death at night. Still observed by its father, the cria begins to suckle even before its mother discards the afterbirth. A vicuña's pregnancy of 11 and a half months ensures a fully developed youngster with a better chance of surviving in this severe environment. The three of them move away from the afterbirth, which could attract the attention of foxes or condors. The marshes support not only vicuñas, leaf-eared mice and many birds feed on the seeds and insects which flourish in these bogs. The small bogs are a welcome oasis in an otherwise bleak and barren land. These rare rodents are viscachas. Rabbit-sized animals, they are master burrowers. But when they're not busy making burrows, they spend much of the time dozing in the early morning sun. Related to the chinchilla, the viscacha also has a fine coat to keep out the intense cold. Frightened by the shadow of a passing condor, the viscacha gives a warning cry, almost too high-pitched for the human ear.
Here, there are woodpeckers without trees. This is the Andean flicker, which probes for grubs and worms in the soft ground. In the absence of trees, they build their colonies by drilling into the soft rock to make nest holes in the cliffs near the marshes. The crea is now one day old. In this treeless terrain, speed is the best defense against predators. That's why just 15 minutes after birth, newborn vicuñas can run faster than a man. A favorite Andean saying is, may he run like a vicuña. Within two weeks of giving birth, a female vicuña is ready to mate again. A short courtship is the prelude to a tender mating. The Altiplano supports several types of high-altitude plants. Among them are lupins, living at over 17,000 feet. Different kinds of cacti thrive in Lauca National Park. Designed for drought, they also tolerate the extremes of temperature and intense ultraviolet light on these elevated plains. The Loretta is perhaps one of the strangest plants found on the Altiplano. Growing barely an inch a year, a 10-foot wide specimen is several centuries old. This rock-hard cushion plant is formed from thousands of flowering plantlets. The local people use the woody centers of the Loretta as fuel Centuries of smoke from burning Loretta has blackened the wall of this cave. Here, for two and a half thousand years, the people of the Altiplano painted scenes of Vicuña. The Inca treasured these animals so highly that only the emperor and the royal family could wear the magnificent cloth woven from their coats. Anyone else found in possession of this fabric was immediately executed. Other ancient Indian artists created geoglyphs, a kind of landscape mural formed by arranging stones on hillsides. The giant of them all is 393 feet tall, supposedly the largest human figure in the world.
Also depicted on the hillsides are llamas and alpacas. Up to 4,000 years old, these geoglyphs reveal how long the native people have been linked to these animals. For these ancient peoples, the cherished llama and alpaca were a vital source of meat, hides, fuel, and of course, wool. Brightened with vegetable and mineral dyes, the wool was woven into elaborate and stunning fabrics, such as these, which are 2,400 years old. Textiles were the pride of the ancient Peruvians, who used them for the everyday and for the holiest of rituals. Later, the Incas also became master weavers and covered their fabrics with deep spiritual symbols. Highly religious, their lives were dictated by the mountain gods to whom they made offerings of llamas. If they needed finer wool for their rituals, they built great stone walls to trap the sacred wild herds of Acuna. In 1540, the last Inca fort surrendered to the Spanish conquistadors, marking the end of the great Inca Empire. The Spanish looted gold and silver and slaughtered millions of llamas, guanacos, alpacas, and vicuñas. The Indians were forced to build churches, and yet they continued to worship Pachamama, literally Mother Earth. The lives of the Highland Indians are still linked with their domestic animals, whose wool keeps them warm. Like the animals, the people have also physically adapted to their cold world. They have extra capillaries in their fingers and toes, bringing more blood to warm their extremities. The coarse wool from the llama is woven into blankets, rugs, or saddlebags. The softer, more valuable alpaca wool is kept for making clothing. Both llamas and alpacas yield wholesome meat. The men plate the ropes used in everyday work, while the women knit the clothing to combat the freezing temperatures which often dip below zero at nightfall. On the highest summits, with the wind chill factored in, temperatures may drop to minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Thousands of years ago, Andean herdsmen interbred camelid ancestors to create a pack animal. They needed an animal with endurance, dependability, and intelligence. A good-natured personality was a bonus. The result was the llama, their prized beast of burden.
The llama could carry 100 pound packs for distances of 20 miles a day. Plus, it carried a good luck token for its trip. Llamas were the backbone of the Inca Empire. Their armies used them to carry supplies throughout the mountainous terrain of the high Andes. Now they're becoming a rare sight as trucks take over. But there are still inaccessible places where pack trains are needed. With identification ribbons on their banana-shaped ears, these llamas are all packed and ready to go. The Aymara's herds are often mixed and consist of llamas, the largest of all the South American camels, and alpacas, which are smaller with a much thicker coat of fine fiber. The huarizo is the result when these two are crossbred. Looking after these animals is a time-consuming business. The herds need to be always on the move, either feeding on the coarse uplands or grazing on the more nutritious marshes. These are nurtured by ancient aqueducts, kept in working order by the Aymara to transport water from the snow line. Together with recently built channels, they not only keep the marshes green and productive all year round, but enlarge the area of pasture. This allows the Aymara to increase the size of their herds. Over the centuries, the native people developed and perfected their breeding techniques. Most male animals are castrated, leaving just a few top quality males as studs. Llamas and alpacas, like the wild vicuña, drop their young in the summer, giving the youngsters a better chance of survival. Breeders try to raise white llamas. Their coats are more in demand, since their wool can be dyed any color. Despite careful husbandry, a few animals are born partially blind. To try and prevent such handicapped animals from falling into the mire, warning flags rustle around the bogs to keep them at bay. Not always successfully. Women and children have the task of tending the herds, walking great distances each day between the various pastures. At dusk, the herds are driven home to corrals. These are often protected from evil spirits by stone piles called apachetas. But the Aymara and their livestock have more pressing problems. This region of Chile is now suffering its sixth successive year of drought. Wild vicuñas are feeding on the irrigated pastures as their own feeding grounds dry up, thus competing with the domesticated camels for food.
The progressive shrinking of the smaller lakes is not a good omen for the future. A dry and completely desiccated landscape is no place, even for vicuñas. Two and a half thousand miles farther south, near the tip of South America, at the uttermost end of the earth, there's a very different story. These torrents and lakes are fed by the glaciers of southern Chile's vast Patagonian ice cap. Andeans have always worshipped the mountains as gods. Some believe the mountains are their ancestors. They believe the mountains are all-powerful, and they are at their mercy. The mountains could kill with an avalanche, blizzard, or rockfall. Or bestow life-giving rains to lakes and ponds. In summer, the meadows brim with color. These southern beech forests echo to the raucous call of the austral parakeets as they forage to feed their young. The Guanaco's range is immense, but many have found their home in Torres del Paine. Two thousand Guanacos now live here, but in 1975 there were only a hundred left in the park. In the past they were hunted for their skins and to make way for sheep and cattle ranchers. This is where the flatlands of Patagonia meet the foothills of the Andes. Retreating glaciers have molded the landscape, scouring out hollows where lakes and marshes have since formed. These meadows are the Guanaco's favorite feeding grounds. After they've had their fill, the guanacos can afford to laze in the sun and shelter from the continuously blowing wind. Mm -hmm. 
As one writer wrote, if cold is the Andean hell, wind is its devil. Nothing, not even Darwin's Rhea, escapes the blasting winds that blow straight off the Patagonian ice cap. Guanacos have a slightly different lifestyle from the Vicuñas. Their families live in defended territories for only part of the year. In winter, they form large herds and migrate to other feeding grounds. In spring and summer, when they are territorial, each male uses vantage points to watch for trespassers on their personal patches. A young male has strayed into this family and makes advances to one of the females. She rebuffs a clumsy attempt at mating with much spitting. Joined by her jealous mate, they chase off the interloper. On reaching the boundary of his defended land, the resident male pauses, letting the trespasser escape onto neutral territory. Just like the wild vicuñas, young guanacos are also evicted from their families. This time, the father attempts to force a young female to leave home, but her mother obviously thinks she's too young to go and tries to shield her from him. She'll soon join another group or be taken over by a young male. This is a bachelor group of about 150 young males. Much of their time is spent in play fighting. Skills acquired during these skirmishes will become vital when the animals reach maturity at around three years of age. Then they'll fight to acquire and retain their own territories. Guanacos have to watch out for natural enemies. A predator has been spotted, in this case, a prowling fox. Although capable of taking large animals, the foxes rarely bother with guanacos. A condor scours the country for carrion. The Caracara is another scavenger. Once these have dined, not much remains. 
Adult guanacos often die from breaking a leg during territorial chases. Dr. Bill Franklin, a wildlife ecologist from the United States, has been studying guanaco and its three cousins for the past 25 years. By tranquilizing them with drugs from a dart gun, he's able to obtain vital statistics. Franklin believes that knowledge about these rugged, precious creatures will help ensure their place in the wilderness areas of South America. Others feel the guanaco could be put to economic use and its wool harvested like sheep. Already the world has had a glimpse of this exotic fabric. The London Salon of Princess Diana's fashion designer, David Emmanuel, is a far cry from the high peaks of the Andes. See, what I love about it is that I think, I think I've actually dropped things with it. I've just decided now what on earth to do with it, because it's like liquid. Wonderfully fine cloth, produced from guanaco wool, has excited the designer with its possibilities. Guanaco herds are protected in Chile and Peru, but this fleece came from an experimental guanaco project in Wales. Today, there's an even more valuable crop that grows on the backs of vicuñas. As their numbers increase, there's the prospect of harvesting their golden fleece. Five centuries ago, the Incas held a grand roundup of vicuñas every four years. The fit animals were sheared and released, the sick killed for meat. When the Spanish destroyed the Inca Empire, vicuña conservation ceased and the animals were slaughtered relentlessly. By 1967, they were nearly extinct, saved only in the nick of time by international protection. Now their numbers are slowly recovering, and national park wardens have special permission to catch a few for shearing. Only a portion of the wool is clipped, leaving enough to protect the animals from the cold. <laughs> Worth its weight in gold, this amazingly soft, light fleece will be sent for processing to Santiago, Chile's capital. It's hoped that eventually, when their population increases further, it may be possible once again to market vicuña fabric, considered the finest natural cloth in the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
The profits from the precious vicuña wool may be used to compensate the Aymara. Their irrigated pastures, once meant only for their domesticated camels, must now be shared with the wild vicuñas. With special care, the vicuña may have a future as bright as its golden fleece and flourish once again as the living treasure of the Andes. <laughs>